Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Storytime. Today, OP ruined her cousin's hair, but first, customer asked me to count out a bag of live crickets in front of her, loses out on bonus crickets. I, 32 female, work part-time at a pet store to supplement my income as my salary of a full-time teacher doesn't always pay the bills. Plus, I have a few pets and 20% off of in-store purchases is rather helpful. Anyway, one of the things we supply are live and frozen feeder animals for things like reptiles, certain aquatic creatures, and invertebrates. These include things like mice, rats, dubia roaches, bloodworms, mealworms, waxworms, superworms, and crickets. The mice and rats are either frozen or live, but either way they're easy to count and box up for the customer. Dubia roaches, mealworms, waxworms, and superworms are pre-packaged and price marked, but the crickets are not. Crickets are kept in these large containers with mesh top, egg cartons for the crickets to climb and hide in, cricket food, and hydration. This means when customers ask for crickets, which we usually sell by the dozen, we have to count and retrieve them manually while putting them in a plastic bag we then fill with air and tie off to go with the customer. Our method for transferring the crickets is to lightly tap the egg cartons over a funnel-like object that doesn't have a hole at the bottom. We tap the crickets in, wrap the plastic bag around the mouth of the funnel, then tip it and lightly tap the crickets into the bag. Some crickets jump in out of order or cling to others, so often customers are given bonus crickets, which we're okay with, it's better than shorting them, so customers are always given the right amount or often more than what they asked for without an increase in price. Most people get this. The customer in this story did not. A woman comes in and she asked for four dozen crickets, 48 crickets total. I went to the back, tapped the crickets from the cartons into the funnel and then counted them into the bag. As per usual, the occasional extra cricket tumbled or hopped in, probably putting the total to a bit over 50 by the time I was done. I bagged them, tied the bag, then took them to the counter. Now. I don't know if this woman was having a bad day or she had been stiffed by another store in the past, but she demanded that we count out the crickets in front of her before she pay for them. I explained that it was likely that she got more than what she asked for and counting out 48 crickets individually would take a little while. She insisted she wanted to be sure we weren't ripping her off. So I got one of those small plastic critter keepers and a pair of tongs. I opened the bag, making it deflate and slightly more painful to work with, and inserted the tongs. Delicately, so not to crush the crickets, I grabbed each one with the tongs and started counting slowly so not to crush the crickets with the tongs or lose my place while counting, something I do struggle with, and dropped each individually counted cricket into the critter keeper. So after about 5 to 10 minutes at the counter meticulously counting crickets with tongs, and maybe deliberately taking a little bit longer than I had to out of spite, a line was building up behind the woman and I was getting close to the end of my count. Eventually, I hit the grand total of what she paid for. 48 crickets. And wouldn't you believe it, there were 10 left over in the bag. Almost a whole extra free dozen she would have gotten had she not asked me to count. I said, oh, would you look at that, my mistake? You were right, I did miscount. I'll put these other ones back and ring you up for the 48. I'll be right back. And before she could protest, I wandered off to dump the last 10 crickets back into the cricket container. When I came back to check her out, she was silent, not looking at me did her best to ignore the irritated looks of the customers lining up behind her while I poured her 48 crickets back into a plastic bag. She paid, then slunk off sheepishly out the door without a thank you or a glance back. I then got through the rest of the line quickly and apologized to the customers in line for the wait. I sent them home with some free samples, thanked them for their patience, then continued along with my shift. She never complained, and she did return to the location several times after. She never asked anyone to count crickets again. Our next story is, back up your videos and leave everything else by the wayside, okay? I've been in and out of a lot in my life, both job-wise and school-wise. So I've been an IT, a programmer, been a cook, then a retailer, and I'm in my late 30s. I've got my office stories, my retail stories, my college stories, and my friend's story. So some years back, I had a side hustle. I did some IT work as a favor to friend, family, and neighbors. I happen to work for this buddy of mine. Things to keep in mind, it's this story is way over a decade old. This story involves a pothead in back when it was completely illegal. 
I didn't see it, but when you know someone a long time and when you smell it, you know it's pot. Okay, here we go. I walked to a friend's apartment and was offered some work to do some spyware and virus cleanup. Upon entering, you smell the skunk weed. This is a guy who eats, drinks, sleeps the life. He even has a surfer lingo to his voice. Also, I check out his system. It's so terrible I can barely run anything, so I force it into safe mode and start from there. In the end, I tell, your system is royally borked. He looks at me crazy. I say, it's so virus-ridden and spyware-ridden that you can't even use it. I'm gonna have to reinstall your OS and restore everything. I noticed you have a lot of documents and stuff for your classes you have vote. He cuts me off with, save the prawn, man, save the prawn. Spelled it wrong intentionally. Try not laugh ahead of the story, lol. Maybe it's the P asterisk T smell in the air. Maybe it's the lack of oxygen, but I complied and did that very thing. He'd been downloading in mass and just storing it. I filled an entire DVD, R rack lol. Then I save his documents, photos and such. He paid me for my backup work and the DVDRs it's over. Or so I thought, month later. I am out there again. Same problem, same solution, save the prawn, man, save the prawn, okay, save the prawn. Six months later with each month, I'm coming back to do the same. I'd come back each time and save the prawn first and then I'm getting peeved has mistreating his PC like this, but I am getting paid to fix it. Oh well, by now it's getting to me having to come back regularly. I finally have this idea to further inspect a disc. I scan one disc, one disc, and I find all kinds of bad stuff. For those out there who don't know, your average video contains 60 frames per second. That's 60 images that make up a second. You can just easily infect a video stream within a few frames. I had a long talk by which I told him his issues, which I can summarize in these few phrases. Me, look dude, I don't mind you paying me and all, but I'm coming back to the same problem. You're trashing your PC and having me spend good hours restoring a backup you can do on your own. Pothead. Dude, just fix my PC already. If you did the job right, it wouldn't get this way again and again. That's the last straw, dude. Me. So you want me to just save the prawn and fix your PC, right? Pothead. Sure, dude. I promptly back up his PC one last time. I back up his prawn. I restore the backup image, so now all his documents are back to a month ago state. Then I take every single DVDR I ever wrote for him, put them in a box. The box is now filled. I go down the stairwell of his apartment and then I dump it in the dumpster. I turn to my buddy and say, there fixed your problem, aftermath. I did some digging as I reconnected with him in the restaurant industry. One month later, he calls me. L all I refuse to do any more work. Loved taking his money, hated see him trash his PC. The pothead lost the progress in any games he had going. Small potatoes. The bigger was he lost any college papers he had been writing. So he had to rewrite a paper or two that were supposed to take a semester in about a week. He had effectively screwed himself in his classes. The best part was, if he restored that backup again, he'd be back to square one again. Our next story is stop fixing the photo printers during Christmas rush? Sure. Why not? To preface, I used to work in the photo lab of a very prevalent retail pharmacy. You know the one. I was good fast, efficient, and always provided the most excellent customer service. Customers loved me. I adapted official procedures to make them better and improve the final project. And I fixed the photo printers. If you've worked in a 1HR photo lab, you know that no one fixes those things. They jam constantly, overheat, never get replaced or updated. They'd break at least weekly if not more. Same thing with the kiosks and receipt printers and POS system. It's a nightmare. I haven't worked there since 2017 and they finally updated the pin pads six years later. Because the printers would break so often and I had experience fixing printers from when I worked at a school, I'd just whip out a screwdriver, open them up, and fix them myself. It was faster and easier than putting in a ticket and it meant I could keep churning out orders during peak instead of being one to two printers down at all times. Now, shortly before the holidays, we got a new AM. He'd previously managed another store but had to step into a less stressful position due to a heart issue. The guy was a prick and created stress for himself. He treated team members like garbage and most people were too afraid to stand up to him. I had a good working relationship with our GM so I was not afraid of this guy and he would often single me out because of it. At one point during Christmas rush he caught me with my metaphorical pants down, screwdriver out and disassembling a printer that had suddenly stopped working. He chewed me out told me to stop fixing the printer immediately and just put it in a ticket. 
If he caught me fixing a printer again, he'd have to take disciplinary action. Cue malicious compliance. I stopped fixing the printers and just put in tickets. In about a day, we were down to one functioning 4 times 6 printer that was overworked to heck and back. That printer almost caught fire while I was off shift because no one was able to unjam it. He never told me to stop fixing the printers again and left me alone the entire rest of the time I worked there. I ended up being wrongfully terminated due to an ADA leave for a major surgery when corporate never got my paperwork. Despite my PT faxing it over, and I found a better job that I love at a company I still work for. Prick manager ended up getting fired several months later for customer complaints. Our next story is wanna lie about your natural hair color? Have fun with an awful dye job. My wife, 22 female, and I, 22 male, got my little sister, 12 female, some semi-permanent red hair dye for Christmas. She really wanted it and was very excited to use it on herself and her cousins. The hair dye is bright red, assuming you're light blonde or bleached, but sis has dark brunette hair so the dye becomes a dark burgundy on her. Everything that follows is what she told me. I wasn't there for any of it. Sis brought her hair dye to family Christmas at grandma's so she could share it with our plethora of cousins. One of our cousins, Anna 16 female, is pretty entitled. She's a compulsive liar and manipulator. I keep my audio recording app handy on my phone when I'm around her should I have to use it because I don't trust her. She has also done some mild bullying and taking advantage of Sis in the past year or two. Anna asked Sis to have her hair dyed. Anna obviously has had her hair bleached to a medium light or light blonde. Sis asked Anna, is your hair bleached or dyed? If it is, then it's going to turn out really bright and look crazy. Anna said, no, what haha, this is my natural hair color. This is where the malicious compliance comes in. Sis and my other cousins share a knowing look before getting to work. After they let the paste sit for a reasonable amount of time, they wash it out. Instead of pretty mauve accents like in Sis's hair, the back of Anna's hair looks like a bright, clowny, patchy mashup. Anna's response, I kid you not, was to look surprised and say, Oh yeah, I did bleach my hair, I totally forgot this wasn't my natural color, lol. At this moment, Anna's mother came in and was not happy. Anna wanted to take even more dye from my sister to try to even out the clown hair she had given herself, but Anna's mom stood up for my sister and wouldn't let her take more. This dye is only semi-permanent, but it will still take 10 to 15 shampoos to be fully washed out. I only learned all this because I took my sister out on a breakfast date after New Year's. I was worried that Anna had bullied Sis into using as much hair dye as she did. When I asked about it, it turns out Sis just wanted to let Anna pay for her obvious lie. And with that being said, that's all we have for today if you can't get enough malicious compliance stories. Click the video on the left, and if you want to watch our most recent video, click the video on the right.